We're in 1 John chapter number 4 this morning. Begin reading at verse number 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and every one that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. Herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. On Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays, I generally start my work day here at the church by going into the conference room to pray. Now, I have my own office here, but if you know anything about my office, it's filled with work and with projects and things that need to be done. And I find that all of these things are a distraction. And so if I remove myself over, which is across the conference room, was on the other side of the building, and it's basically just a, a nice room with nice chairs in it, when I move myself over there, all of those distractions are eliminated. And so it's easier, I find it easier to pray. And so I take my missions conference book, and I have a spiral notebook that I use, and I uh, pray through the missions conference book, uh, praying for the missionaries, and then I have a spiral notebook that I've used for several years now, and I write the requests of the, the, the people, okay, for you guys, and if I went through there, many of your names would be in there, or your situations, or your family would be in there, and I keep track, and I, when the, the Lord answers a request, and I scratch that out, and I keep track of all those things, and it's just, a, it's something that I, it kind of helps me, to, and it sees the Lord at work. And so, anyway, I, as I was in there this week, I'm praying through the missionaries and praying for you, the Lord began to work, and in the back of that prayer notebook, I wrote down the basic outline for this morning's message. And the title of this message will be, The Love of Christ for People. The Love of Christ for People. So let's pray. Father, we ask that this morning you would do a work worthy of your own name. We don't have enough strength to help one person here. If all of us got together, we could not help one person. But you, Father, by your Spirit, could move every person here forward. You could meet every need. You could do what's necessary. And, Father, we are not asking this as a favor for the Lord Jesus already purchased this for us. And so in his name we are asking these things because of the Lord Jesus. And so Father, do your work in your way by your spirit because of the Lord Jesus. For we ask this in his precious holy name. Amen. In the Bible, the word world is used in a variety of ways. It is a very broad word. And so when you read the word world in the scriptures, you have to do a little bit of thinking to actually see what it means in that particular passage. In some spots, it refers to the universe. In other spots, it refers to the earth itself. In some spots, it, re it refers to the contents of the world. In some spots, it refers to the inhabitants of the world. It also refers to the system in which the world operates, and it, it also in, um, it means sometimes the things and the powers that are against God. So it has a very broad meaning, very broad scope. So when we read a verse like John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, we have to be careful to, to, we can get the wrong idea because the word world is used so many different ways in the scripture. Now, 
You know that my mind works in pictures. Whether that's good or not, I don't know, but it works in pictures. And so while I was sitting in the conference room praying, and I, as I start to jot these things down, as they're, the Lord's bringing them to my mind, a picture popped into my mind. And you're going to probably scratch your head at this picture, but this is what popped into my head. Have you ever seen a sand and gravel machine at a gravel pit? I don't know if you're familiar with these things, but in a sand and gravel pit where they're going to, where they're making building materials, they're not making, they're, they're sorting building materials, they'll buy a spot of ground and they start digging a hole. They've got to have water there. And if you ever see a sand pit, they'll always have a lake there at the sand pit. They dig the earth out and they put it using conveyor belts and machines, they run this dirt this earth, up these conveyor belts, and they drop them through a series of machines with a ton of water. And in these machines are screens or grates. And so as it comes down through these grates, it sorts the bigger stuff gets thrown out, and then it sorts it by size. Do you understand what I'm saying? So through a series of conveyor belts and the water running through these things, they sort the material from the big rocks then to what they call river rock, down to what they call pea gravel, down to sand, the different kinds of sand. And so it's run through a series of screens till they get what they want. Everybody understand that? It's kind of an odd illustration that pops into my mind, but that's what popped into my mind when I was thinking about, for God so loved the world. The, the statement of the world encompasses so much. What would get filtered out and what would we end up with when we filter out the statement, for God so loved the world, what does he actually love? If we ran it through the filter, what would he end up loving? So let's run it through the filter. If we start first about thinking about what do we love, what do we love about the world? Well, let me give you a list. And you, some of these you'll say, yeah, I do, and no, I don't, okay? But here's what we typically love about the world. We love the universe. We love to look up in the night sky and see the stars there. Anybody with me on this? If, you have not, if you're a city dweller and you've never been away from the, where the, there are city lights, you have no idea what you're missing. You've got to get out where it's dark, and when you look up, it's like, wow, this is so amazing. We are mystified and captivated by the universe. We dream of moving, you know, being able to move through these things and go visit these places. And we, we send up telescopes so we can look at it. We send up satellites and all these things so that we can get a handle on what this is. We make movies of all the different ways of thinking about how we would travel from place to place. You know what the problem with all that is? At the speed that we can travel and the length of our lives, we can't get anywhere. The place is so vast that fa traveling as fast as we know how, you still, you, you can only live, if you lived 100 years, you can't get anywhere out of here. It is so vast. But people who study these things, we love it. We love the universe and its vastness and all that it contains. We love the planet. We love the mountains and the rivers. We love the oceans. We love the sky. Most of our vacations are spent getting out of the city and going to some place where we can see more of what this planet has to offer. We can experience the planet. We love the inhabitants of the planet. We love the plants and the trees and the flowers. We love the animals. We love the microscopic and we love the gigantic. We love the newborn kittens and we love the extinct dinosaurs. We also do love people, mostly the people who are just around us or related to us, but we do love some of them. We love the achievements of mankind. We love the art, we love the literature, we love the music and the culture and the architecture and the history. And many people spend their lives either studying these things or trying to add to them. We love 
the structure of the world. We love society and government. We don't always agree with government, but we love a system that will keep things tidy and organized. Unfortunately, some actually even love the evil of the world. Our flesh is drawn to some of the pleasures of this world, even though we know that they're harmful to us and that they're against the wishes of God for us, we're actually, we sometimes love even the evil in the world. So when we think about loving the world, we have all of these things about the world that we love. But if we take all of those things that we just mentioned that we love about the world and we pour them in the hopper and filter it through what does God love, what of that comes out the other end? What gets kicked to the curb as nothing and what gets kept? Now, when God created the heavens and the earth, when he got done with each day, it said, and God saw what he'd made, and it was good. good. When he got all said and done with the six days, and he looks it all over, it says that he saw it, and it said was very. very good. Okay, so he is pleased with how the thing turned out. He did a masterful job at creating the universe and the planets and all the things that inhabit it, but does he love it? Does God love the planet? Does he love the art, the music, the literature, the architecture, and the achievements of man? Does he love society and government? Yes, he instituted them after the fall to keep things under control, but does he love them? Does God love the evil of the world, the sinful pleasures that seem to captivate the heart of man? What in this world does God love? Now, if we want to think about that, the easiest way to think about it is, well, what does he keep? In the end result, what does God keep? If we think about the achievements of man, The Tower of Babel would have probably been the greatest achievement of man. We don't quite actually even understand what they were doing there. But this probably would have been the greatest achievement of man. And what did God do? He shut that thing down. He did not let them get that far on that. He's not looking for those kind of achievements. If you think about the Genesis Flood... You realize that all of the art, all of the history, all of the culture, all of the architecture, all of the achievements up to that point were wiped clean. Remember as a kid, we used to call them blackboards. Now they call them marker boards. But you remember, the, when, how many remember blackboards? Later they were green boards, right? But we still call them blackboards. I'm not sure. <laughs> they were, remember, and you take that eraser and you just... And you just take care of the whole thing. This is what God did in the Genesis flood. Everything that had been done up to that point, he just wiped her all clean. Because it had no value in his world. It's not something that he loves. In the last several thousand years, mankind has rebuilt and advanced And some of the advances that they have taken in technology recently, doesn't it boggle your mind? You look and you think, what in the world? How could they possibly do that? But the reality is the day is not very far off where the slate's going to be wiped clean again. Now, it's not going to be done by a flood. You know, I was thinking about that this morning. You know what a gracious thing that is? that God promised with a rainbow he would not flood the earth? You know, most of us look at the world and say, boy, this place is really getting wicked. What would you think every time it started raining now? If God hadn't made that, that 
promise, you'd have to think, do I get out the boat? Or what do I do here? Every time it started raining, you'd have to think, this is going, we're, we've got to get a flood here. But he promised, it was such a gracious thing for him to do. He promised and put a rainbow in the sky, look, I'm not going to do this again. He did not say he wasn't ever going to destroy the world again. He just said, I'm not going to flood it. The next time is going to be by fire. fire. He's going to burn the whole thing up. All of the achievements, all of the planets, all of the inhabitants, all of, the, the, all of that is going to be burned up. When he destroys the world, what makes it through the filter? People. That's all that makes it through the filter. People. God loves people. The rest of everything, he built the place so that we'd have a place to live. He made it a nice place, but he doesn't love it. He's going to take all of that stuff and it's all going to be gone. But what makes it through the filter is people. God loves people. When he made man, he breathed into man the breath of life, and man became a living soul. He linked man's life with his own, and every man will exist as long as God exists. Yes. You are an eternal being. God made you specifically that way. God loves people. Now, I am guessing that this is not news to, to most people. Everybody's heard that. Oh, God loves us. God loves the world. Almost everybody's heard that. But when we filter this, well, first off, this was, was shown by Jesus Christ. Okay? The love that God has for people was demonstrated unmistakably through Jesus Christ. It's demonstrated... Is it not when it says the word became flesh and dwelt among us, speaking of Jesus Christ, when it says he came unto his own, when Christ saw the multitude of people as his, in his ministry here, did does it not say over and over again, he was moved with compassion. It says, call him Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sin. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friend. Speaking of Jesus Christ, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But God commended or demonstrated his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Look at verse number 9 as we, in our passage here. If I can find verse number 9. In this was manifest the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. If we dump all that is in the world into the hopper and sort it out, the only thing that remains is people. God loves people. But let's run it through another filter. Let's run it through a finer screen, if you will. If we run the love of God for people through a finer screen, we find that God loves individuals. Yes. He doesn't just love the mass of humanity, but he loves individual people. This is so profoundly demonstrated by Jesus Christ. Let's quickly run through some examples here. The rich young ruler in Mark chapter number, number 10 he comes to the Lord justifying himself that he has done basically everything right. Now, wouldn't that irritate you if you were the Lord? Wouldn't you think, well, here's this guy justifying himself, trying to tell me that he's done everything right. 
And the Lord looks at him, and what does it say? Loves him. Here's a man justifying himself. And the Lord looks at him and loves him. And then tells him the truth about himself. The man walks away choosing money over the Lord. The Lord knew this was going to take place. And yet he looked at this man, knowing that he's going to choose money over himself, and loves him. The woman who had the medical problem in Mark chapter number 5. She has spent her entire fortune on doctors. They haven't helped her at all. And she believes that if she can just touch the garment, the hem of the Lord's garment, that she will be healed. When she finds the Lord, it is complete pandemonium. They are, it is a, a mess. There are so many people there trying to get to the Lord. They are pushing and shoving everybody. And she knows if I can just touch his robe, I will be healed. So she makes her way through the crowd. All of these people pushing and shoving the Lord. And in the midst of this complete chaos, the Lord says, somebody touched me. And the disciples said, are you crazy? We are getting pushed back and forth here. Everybody's touching us. We are getting shoved back and forth. And the Lord, in the midst of this chaos, speaks individually to this woman who needed healed. The Lord loves individuals. In Mark chapter number 1, we have a leper. This, is, this disease, leprosy, is one that totally separates you from everybody. I, I, I can't really get my mind to wrap around this. If you ever think about what this would mean, you get leprosy, and you were removed from all of your family and friends and you were separated completely out of society, and they formed a leper colony. All these people with the same disease are in the same place. So everybody that you're around is sick and dying. Can you imagine how difficult that would be to be in that life? To sit there with all of these people who are, it's a serious, very difficult disease, and you're stuck with all of these people away from your family and friends, all with people who are totally, totally sick. And you were not allowed to be around anybody, much less nobody would come near you and much less touch you. But in Mark chapter number one, a leper comes and the Lord touches this man and heals him. Think about the individual contact there of the Lord. Lazarus and his sisters. We don't much know much about their past, but the Pharisees referred to Mary, the sister, as a sinner. But the Lord loved that family. And as he stood at Lazarus' grave, he wept so much that the people said, boy, he really loved Lazarus. Right before he raised him from the dead, he stood at Lazarus' grave and wept. The Lord loves individuals. Nicodemus, he's a Pharisee who's got questions, but he doesn't want to suffer the persecution or get razzed for wanting to talk with the Lord. So he comes in the middle of the night. I need to talk to you, but you're not worth talking to in the daytime because people will criticize me for doing so. And the Lord spends individual time with Nicodemus, giving him the answers to the questions that he has. The Lord loves individuals. Zacchaeus is not a very popular person in town. He is a tax collector, and he's dishonest. Nobody likes him. He wants to see the Lord, but he's too short to see over the crowd. Nobody's going to let him to the front of the line. I can tell you that right now. So he decides... I'll climb up a tree so I can at least get a glimpse over the top of people's heads and be able to see the Lord. And in the midst of all of these people, the Lord looks up and says, Zacchaeus, come on down. We're going, I'm going to go spend the day with you. The Lord loves individuals. Of course, we have the 12 disciples that felt the love of the Lord individually. 
In fact, uh, John is called the beloved disciple. Uh, The Lord expressed love to them over and over again. Peter, who seems to always be in messing things up, feels the Lord's love in spite of it all. The Lord loves individuals. When we take the love of the world and we filter it out, we find out that the Lord loves people. When we run the, the love of the Lord for people through the filter, we find out that actually the Lord loves individuals. God loves individuals. But let's run it through the filter one more time. Let's run this through the filter. It's only got one tiny little hole in it. And what we find is God loves you. When you boil it all down, what the word means, God so loved the world, what it really means is that God loves you. This is a life-changing statement. Now, I'm going to use an illustration that I hate to use. But I'm going to use the illustration of the lottery. Now, let me qualify all this. I despise the lottery. I am against gambling in any form whatsoever for lots of reasons. Um, One, when I was a kid, you never saw pawn shops. They were very rare, pawn shops. You never saw big billboards that, do you have gambling problems, da 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 You remember remember those days? I'm old enough to remember that here in Des Moines, that we did not have these kinds of issues. This has not solved problems in our society. They have preyed on men's weaknesses, and they have, the ills of our society are unquestionable. It's just from gambling are unquestionable. So I hate to use it as an illustration. I also hate to use it as an illustration because our conception of the lottery is totally uh, erroneous. People have the idea that winning the lottery would be a really good thing. And the exact opposite is actually true. If you don't believe me, do a little bit of research on it. You think, I'm going to get this money, and it's going to solve all of my problems, and life's going to be good. The exact opposite is true. If you don't believe me, just look it up on the Internet. Type in lottery winners and happiness, and you're going to find out it's not there. Most people who won the lottery, a huge percentage, by the way, the big, when they win the big lottery, actually declare bankruptcy within, I think, five years. He's like, how could you win $237 million and declare bankruptcy? Look it up. A huge percentage, probably like 30 to 50%, declare bankruptcy. They think all of my problems are over, but what they find out is the problems that they have, with their, they lose their family and their friends, almost without question. They lose their family and friends over the deal. It complicates the world so much that most of them say it's the worst thing that ever happened to me. In fact, I heard a news guy, who just a, just a news guy on the, talking, and he said, I just read that the happiness rating of people who, run, who win the lottery is the same as people who have a car wreck. <laughs> I thought, wait a second. So I looked that up, and that is the true. It's, that, it's the same happiness rating. If you want to improve your life, go, ha- go have a car wreck. It's just the same as winning the lottery. Okay, so you understand I am against this totally, completely, 100%, all right? Amen, right. Okay, now... But let's use the illustration in the weirdness of our brain because we somehow think it's a good thing. All right? So let's, let's work through this. You're driving down the road. And you see a big bo- billboard that says, I don't know anything about these things. It, some kind of big red ball says power ball or something like that. I don't know anything about that. But it says $257 billion. You're like, And when you see that sign, you say, that's a lot of money. Boy, somebody's going to win a ton of cash. $257 million or billion dollars. Like, wow, that is a lot of cash. Wouldn't be billion, I don't think. $257 million, that's a lot of cash. Somebody is really going to benefit here. So then you're in the gas station, and they got this little computer screen. And it's flipping through the pictures. And it's these people holding a sign, a check from whoever does these things, $10,000 or $50,000, and they're holding the check, and they got a smile on their face. I won this money. And so now you say, wow, look, and it's got their name at the bottom. Look, you know, I never thought you could call these people and borrow money off. But anyway, that's, 
That's part of the problem, by the way, when you win. Anyway, he's saying, look, this person, these individuals won money. But both of those, yeah, they, there's a lot of money, and these people won money. But there's a totally difference when they call your name. Do you see? You just won the $257 million. Do you see the difference? You, yes, they give out this money. Yes, these people, individuals, won this money. I won this money. Yeah. Do you see the difference? Now, that's a totally stupid illustration. But when we think about God loves the world, it's kind of innocuous. God loves individuals. Oh, okay. God loves me. That is a winner. That is something that should shake you. Just the same as you think, boy, if I won the $257 million, that would really change my life. The fact that God loves you should change your life. It should totally change every single part of your existence. God loves the people of the world. God loves individuals. But the life-changing fact is that God loves you. When you take a magnifying glass and you capture the sun in a magnifying glass, and you focus it that down. The power of the sun in just that little spot, focused into the, uh, one tiny point, is powerful. It affects the spot where you're hitting it. The concentrated love of God himself is focused down on you. The entire being of God himself, his love, is focused on you. This is why in Matthew 10 and Luke 12, it tells us that every hair of your head has been numbered. If you lose a hair off your head, you don't even think anything about it. But the love of God is so concentrated and so serious about you that even when you lose a hair that you don't even care about, God cares about it. His love is so concentrated on you that even that insignificant detail is something that he is taking care of and tracking. He loves you. He has been at work in your life every moment of every day for your entire life. God has been focused on you. Now, mostly we go through life ignoring and fighting against that love. But it, it has been there, and it is there at this moment. Nonetheless, God loves you. He loves people, yes. He loves individuals, yes. But God loves you. Now, in a few moments that we have here, let us discuss. What should we do in light of this fact? God loves me. So what should we do in light of this fact? Let me give you four quick response, four responses quickly. Now, usually I don't alliterate my messages, okay? Some people alliterate, but I don't. But actually, all of them begin with R this morning. And it's not my alliteration is normally like the old, remember the old song that they used to sing about school, the three R's of school? Reading, reading, writing, and arithmetic. Uh, that was, they didn't include spelling in that, just, you know. <laughs> <laughs> reading, writing, and arithmetic, that's how mine normally alliterate. But these actually alliterate with the letter R. What should we do about this? Verse number, uh, number one, we need to recognize it. Look at verse number eight here. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. God is love. You need to recognize this truth. Most of the gods that we create of, as man are mean and selfish. Carol and I have been several times down to the Mayan ruins down in South America, different countries down there. And one thing you'll find about the, the Mayan ruins, that god was mean. 
And I use that, that's a small g, that's a man-made God. They were sacrificing humans there. Why? Because they needed to make sure their God didn't get upset with them and do something bad, so they would sacrifice humans to make sure that he, to keep him happy. Most of the gods that men create are that way. They are mean and they are selfish. But my friends, you need to recognize the fact this morning that the one true God isn't like that at all. God loves you and he wants what's best for you. He desires a relationship with you both now and for all of eternity. So recognize it. If you would look around, you would find this to be the truth. There's all kinds of proof in your life already that God loves you. And you need to recognize that fact. Number two, you need to respond to it. Verse number nine. In this was manifested the love of God toward us because that God sent his only, begot, his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. The key word in that is might. That we might live through him. God loves you. There's no doubt about that. But whether you choose to respond to that love is your choice. Now look, there's no doubt in, in, I hope there's no doubt in your mind that God could make you do whatever he wanted to do. If you ever had an older brother, you know that's the case. My older brother used to get my arm behind my back like that and lift it up like that and I'll say uncle or whatever you say uh, he needed me to say or do, I'd do it. Do you realize if God wanted to, he could make you do whatever he wanted done. He's not powerless. But God gives you a choice. Forcing love on someone is not really love. Love must be responded to by choice of the other person. And God is giving you that choice. So respond to it. He has poured out his love on you. He has made a way for you to go to heaven. He has laid out a perfect path for your life. Respond to him. Embrace the love that God has given. You need to recognize the love. You need to respond to the love. You need to, number three, you need to return that love. Look at verse number 19. Verse number 19. We didn't read it earlier. We love him because he first loved us. When we understand and recognize the love that God has for us, when we respond to it, you're going to find that something strange happens within your heart. When you recognize the love and you respond to that love, you're going to find that what happens in your heart is you begin to love God. When you see the love that God is pouring out continually on you, and you embrace that love, what happens to you in your heart is you start to love him back. What you find is that what happens is you begin to fulfill the first commandment. The first commandment, the one great commandment of the scripture is to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, body, and strength. That's the one great command. When you recognize God's love and you respond to it, what you find is his love starts to fill your heart. And that love fills your heart and gets reflected back to him. And you are loving him in return. And you are fulfilling that one great command. You need to recognize the love. You need to respond to it. You need to return that love. And number four, you need to repeat that love or reflect his love. You need to repeat or reflect it. Verse number 11, beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. Now let's bring this thing back full circle here. If we go back to the beginning of the message and we think about all the stuff that we're pouring into the hopper, all the things that we love about this world, and we run it through there, all the things that we love about this world, we run it through the hopper, and it, when it comes out the bottom side, the only thing that God loves is people. Got that? 
Everything we love about the world, we pour it in there, and it comes out, and the only thing God loves out of all of that is people. When his love fills our heart, what are we going to love? All the junk we poured in the top, or only what comes out the bottom? How can we be filled with the love of God and love all that junk? How can we be filled with the love of God and invest our whole existence in that junk? When all that God actually loves all of out of all of that stuff is people. But what we find is when we understand God, we recognize his love. And we respond to that love. And then we are returning that love to him. His love fills our heart. And what happens is we've all just fulfilled the first command. And now we start loving the people around us. Which fulfills the second great command. To love your neighbor as yourself. And we, we are actually a conduit. The love of God flows to us. Fills our heart. And then flows from us to the people around us. And God loves others through us. And so we are repeating or reflecting this love. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. If we let the love of God fill our heart, it will not focus on things or achievements or places or any of this world. It will automatically focus on people. My friend, God loves the world. But when we actually filter out what that actually means, it means that he loves people. And what that actually means is that he loves individuals. But what that actually means is that he loves you. And what should you do about that? Recognize it. Respond to it. Return that love to him and repeat it or reflect it to others. It's the love of Christ for people. Let's pray.